the information that we have available now wouldn't be possible without you know a group of distinct persons throughout our history that dedicated such a significant amount of their life to a very specific cause and just to think that back then they were working on a project that really had no end game they were doing this because they foresaw that something great would be done with this information they were never told what would be done they never knew how much was being collected or from where they were just doing it out of the goodness of their heart because they were passionate about this topic there's an interesting story there that sits behind any person who would submit nest records for 20 years had to have a passion. I worked with Dan as his assistant for about 15 years and have been involved with Mohonk and the Mohonk Preserve and the Research Center now for just under 50 years. Working with Dan, I came as a botanist the vegetational historian, which Dan really wanted and really appreciated. But about two weeks later, my life had changed to embrace everything in natural history and the ecosystem <laughs> that Dan was interested in. I think he was one of the premier 20th century American naturalists and cultural historian uh, historians. He did a lot of history and land use history. And the unique thing about him was he spent most of his life recording things, nature and natural history and uh, cultural and human history at one place. Dan was excited about educating people about what he had found, what he was discovering, the trends, the, the different things he was finding. He was excited about and wanted to tell somebody. And so he always had a great audience through the guests at the Mountain House, through Preserve and public programs, and also through talks with the John Burroughs Natural History Society, you know, Ulster County Garden Clubs, all kind of organizations. You come into where he's working and say, I'm bored. I don't have anything to do. And it's just, I guess you're going to have to get curious about something or interested enough in something to go find something to do, aren't you? So. I didn't know, of course, you know, like consciously what that meant, but the onus was on you to, to find it in yourself. They both spent a lot of time looking for nests and they had a point system rigged up. So it had this kind of mock award ceremony at Bird Club, you know, in the fall every year. And, I think everybody got a lot of laughs out of it. They'd come up with some goofy prize. I remember just going through her bird watching stuff and finding an envelope full of these hand-drawn comics signed by Betsy Brooks. It was mostly about two best birding buddies and all their little things they got into her. The one I remember in particular was getting back from a long birding trip and just crashing on the couch, unable to move or get their housework done and all the other things that they were supposed to be doing. She was also quite involved in putting up bluebird boxes, you know, certainly for decades, she had many dozens of boxes up. I think for years, it was over a hundred. So I, she had, I suspect a pretty big impact on Eastern bluebird populations in Allegheny County. She didn't talk about it a lot, but you know, my sense was that she was pretty aware that being a woman growing up in the place in the time where she was being a professional or an academic was out of her reach. So. You know, I think she really enjoyed doing the research and doing the field work. And, you know, she chose to have a family and be a full-time housewife rather than pursue that. And I don't have the sense that she regretted her choices, but I, you know, I, I think she did come right out and say once that, you know, if she'd been born a few decades later, her professional life might have been a tiny bit different. In the case of, of, of Larry Walkinshaw, here you have a man who, I mean, his nest records date 70 years, I think. And he continued to submit records up until the year he died. Through his whole life, he sort of had to balance the, the, the dental practice side, which was sort of called the day job. And then every waking hour after that, whether it be before work, after work, 
holidays, weekends, that's when he would throw, go do all the birding stuff. In the 1960s, they did a lot of world traveling. I mean, this is when he was working on Cranes of the World, the book he wrote there for 1973. They covered a lot of ground. They were in Africa, they were in Europe, they were you know, over in Asia, they were in Japan. I mean, he went everywhere. And so that, that occupation helped pay for a lot of those trips. A few times we would go out on canoe outings where we would go to a marsh. He wanted to find some crane nests, so he would need people to paddle a canoe for him while he sort of sat in the middle of the canoe. He always banded birds, so he banded birds for probably 60 years. He banded over 40,000 birds. His main efforts were he wanted to preserve their survival, like sandal cranes, Kirtland warblers. He was sort of the key instrumental guy making sure those species survive. Because back in his day, there really weren't many around. Now, like around here, around Michigan, they're all over the place. So they're literally like, every time one flies overhead, it's like, wow, it's grandpa's legacy flying overhead again. It's, it's funny, I'll, I'll look at a crane and you go, wow, I wonder if that's grandpa kind of checking in on me or whatever, you know, or something like that. But um, I, don't, I don't necessarily believe in reincarnation, but you gotta wonder sometimes. If you remember people, they're not really gone. You know, if somebody remembers, so I'm sure that that a lot of the people who filled out cars in the 50s and 60s are now deceased. But it's almost like we're reaching out and touching them, even though they're gone, and remembering the contribution that they made. And now it really enhancing the contribution that they made by making it available to so many researchers.